The Lord be with you. It's a joy to see you. Welcome to Trinity as we continue Lenten worship uh, following Mark's gospel and the theme, Jesus came to serve and to give his life. And this evening's portion of Mark 14 is Jesus in Gethsemane. So we do also get to sing the beloved hymn, Go to Dark Gethsemane this evening. We'll follow the order of Vespers. And I do want to thank those who helped serve the uh, fellowship meal before the service tonight and for all their um, hard work. Turn to the opening hymn, please. It's number 418. Hymn 418, please stand. Twenty-nine. Oh Lord, open my lips. Make haste, O oh God, to deliver me. of your hymnal, please turn to Psalm 22. We will speak responsively. Psalm 22, verses 22 through the end of the psalm. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. For kingship belongs to the Lord. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Posterity shall serve him. Shall be told of the Lord, 
They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Please be seated, hymn 436. reading from Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, We also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. O Lord, have mercy on us. The second reading is from Mark chapter 8. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, 
John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. Deliver me, O Lord my God, for you are the God of my salvation. In you, O Lord, do I put my trust. Leave me not, O Lord my God. Deliver me, O Lord my God, for you are the God of my salvation. My dear friends in Christ, hear the text for this evening, Mark 14, verses 26 to 52. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas came, 
one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body. And they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. This is our text. Dear friends in Christ, by now we are some days into the Lenten season. If you've checked your calendar, it's been a full two weeks since it began on Ash Wednesday. And many days remain. And we pray that God would make those good days for us, his children, good days for us to hear God's word, and good days for us prayerfully and patiently to reflect on that word that we hear and to believe it, and to live according to it. Easter is coming, but for now, it is Lent. And as we reflect on this particular portion of St. Mark's Passion account just heard, we consider what it is that we are reading about here, and we consider what meaning it all holds for our lives. Today's reading to review encompasses the events late Thursday evening of Holy Week, on the Mount of Olives, in the Garden of Gethsemane. First, Jesus' word about the disciples falling away and their unanimous response, we won't. And then next, Jesus' anguished prayer to his Father while his disciples sleep and take their rest. Also, Judas' betrayal and a desperate strike with the sword and Jesus' bold words to his captors and finally even a naked man fleeing for his life. I ask you, has a more dramatic scene ever been penned in all of literature or painted on canvas or acted out on a stage? Not even close. And to think this is all true history. To think when God came on earth among us in the flesh, such things as these happened. The inspired account of these true events must be engaged with. We Christians must interact with it. We must ask very earnestly, what does this mean for me? Among the truths the Holy Spirit would teach us, one truth this evening stands out, and it is a contrast between God's Son, the man, Christ Jesus, and every other man, every other person, every other person human being, we who still have the old Adam hanging around our neck. Whereas Christ is strong, we are weak. Whereas Christ is steadfast, we are faltering. Whereas Christ is submissive, we are rebellious. And whereas Christ's words prove true, man's words prove false. Does not the account tonight teach these things? I mean, Jesus begins by predicting two things, one of which is that the disciples, when the crisis comes, will all fall away, and the other thing he predicts we'll get to in a moment. He says, you will all fall away, in verse 27, you will all fall fall away, and the disciples, led by Peter, insist they will not. They'll remain steadfast, they'll remain loyal to Jesus, even if they have to die. That's what they said. Yet in the very next scene, the reader can't help but notice a problem. Those bold disciples are actually a miserably weak bunch. Even the three regarded as the leaders among them, sometimes called the pillars, the inner circle, Peter, James, and John, even they can't prop their droopy eyes open and stay awake a mere hour watching as Jesus had requested them to do. 
The point of their weakness is only emphasized by Mark's triple repetition. I mean, three times he relates to us that Jesus returns, having gone away to pray, and he finds the men snoozing. Under these circumstances, what can the disciples say? In verse 40, Mark writes, and they did not know what to answer Jesus. Meanwhile, Jesus, for his part, has been in anguish, praying. And these have not been gimme prayers, like Christians often pray. Gimme health, gimme wealth, gimme happiness, God. No, Jesus has been praying after the pattern that he himself taught. My Father, thy will be done. See, Jesus knew that he was appointed for a hard task, the hard task of bearing and being smitten for the sins of the world. If Jesus had not recoiled at the thought, then his humanity would have been just a sham. But this man, this God-man Jesus, is your true brother. And just as surely as you have fallen short of the glory of God, he was the one appointed by God to answer for it all and to bear the dreadful curse for your soul. No wonder then that Jesus' soul was very sorrowful, even to death. So in his anguish, Jesus prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass and the bitter cup might be removed. Yet, he added, not what I will, but what you will. See that? Not what I will, but what you will. And in contrast, The disciples of Jesus, Judas especially, but also all the others, including the naked runaway, in contrast, all those said in chorus that night, yet not what you will, but what I will. And haven't we done the same? Isn't that the sum and substance of the sins we commit every day or the good we omit to do? In our stubborn clinging to our way, even though God points in a different direction, aren't we saying to our maker, not what you will, but what I will? What a tremendous mystery then. And what truly amazing grace that this one, this Jesus, would press forward for us. Mark, writing by the Holy Spirit, makes crystal clear in our text that the disciples are weak men and ungodly. Peter's denial of Jesus, which we'll hear about next Wednesday, only underscores the point. Their words prove false. St. Paul, writing to the Romans, is in agreement with this. He says, for while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Did you hear? Notice that you and I are not righteous or good by nature, but sinners. Yet did you notice also that God shows his love for us? In other words, God loves us. Not after we have done something deserving it or because of anything in us, but just because he loves us, which is his grace. And we know this because Christ died, Paul writes. Christ died for us. Yes, at Gethsemane and From Gethsemane, Jesus Christ pressed forward toward the cross. For rebels like us, he was submissive to the will of his Father. And in love for people just like us, Jesus laid down his life for us. So Jesus fulfilled the scriptures indeed. Those scriptures, for example, that said, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. 
Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53. And I tell you, friends, Lent necessitates that we rightly view our poor sinful condition, yet at the same time, Lent necessitates that we rightly view the surpassing, incomparable, glorious love of God the Father and of Jesus Christ, His Son, for us. But that's not all. Jesus in our text also offers that peek forward, that tantalizing word about being raised up and going to Galilee. Remember I said at the beginning of the text, Jesus predicted two things. First, that all the disciples would fall away. And then he added another prediction. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Also in this word, Jesus' love is evident. Because he spoke that word so that his disciples might have comfort and encouragement. And also today, even in the face of our weakness, our faltering, our rebellion, our falsehoods that continue to be part of our life as fallen creatures, Jesus comes near with his loving word of comfort and encouragement. It is as if he would say to us, I have been raised up. And I meet you in my word and sacraments to share with you my resurrection life. I bestow forgiveness upon you daily and richly in my means of grace. I unite myself to those who are baptized into my death and resurrection. By my Holy Spirit, I strengthen your faith. I myself go with you every step of the way in your walk as my disciples and as my witnesses. Because I love you, I have died for you and risen for you. Because I love you, says Jesus, I give you faith which unites you to me forever. So today's scripture reading highlights the contrast for us between Jesus and us, but also it underscores the great love that Jesus has for us. And these basic and very important truths will continue to bless you, God's people, throughout this season of Lent, to Easter and beyond, and through all the days of your life on earth, until, by God's grace, you come to the end of your journey in heaven. Amen. The peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Please stand and let us sing the Magnificat. Let my prayer rise before you as incense.
Our prayers this evening are the collect for the second Sunday in Lent, which we prayed on Sunday, and perhaps you are praying throughout this week. Also a prayer for God's aid in times of our temptation. Then we pray for the sick, including Howard Bruner, who is at St. Luke's Hospital. And we remember those who grieve, including uh, Todd Annette, whose father Harold died, and also the family of Joyce Morehouse, our member who was also called home to heaven. And we also include a prayer for those who are lonely. Please stand and turn to page 233. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, you see that of ourselves we have no strength. By your mighty power, defend us from all adversities that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, through your Son, you have promised us forgiveness of sins and everlasting life. Govern our hearts by your Holy Spirit, that in our daily need and especially in all time of temptation, we may seek your help and by a true and lively faith in your word, obtain all that you have promised. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. O Father of mercies and God of all comfort, our only help in time of need, look with favor upon your servant, Howard. Assure him of your mercy. Deliver him from the temptations of the evil one and give him patience and comfort in his illness. If it please you, restore him to health, or give him grace to accept this tribulation with courage and hope. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, into whose keeping we entrust our loved ones, help Todd, Annette, and the whole family, as well as the family of Joyce Morehouse and all of us, to look to you in our time of sorrow remembering the cloud of faithful witnesses with which we are surrounded. Grant that we may one day share in the joys of those who now rest in your presence, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Ever-present Lord, you have promised never to leave us, nor forsake us, but to abide with us to the end of time. Grant that those who live alone may not be lonely, but find both comfort from your promises and fulfillment in loving you and their neighbors all their days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. O oh God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us bless the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit 
be with you all. We will sing the final two stanzas of Let Us Ever Walk with Jesus. <laughs>